and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of the fast RPG, and the and the mad and the madman behind the art of the genre, as well as a lot of other things that we don't have enough time to go into all of. And now coming back with Fast's first expansion, known as the Core Compendium Volume One, the one and only Scott Taylor. How you doing today, man? Hey, yeah, I'm doing great. It's great uh, to be here. Always always fun in the temple. So I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to show up tonight. Yep. So. When it comes to these sort of when it comes to these sort of expansions, which it the first thing I'd, ha I'd have to ask is, were a lot of the things in these things that were originally conce originally conceptualized when Fast was being developed, and just and there just wasn't enough room, or were some of them made after the fact? Yeah, I mean it's a good question. Uh, you know, Fast is something that uh, is it, it's always in development because I'm always playing it at my table. Um, so it, it's constantly, um, you know, getting played and getting worked on. And whenever I see something that comes up, um, that has an interesting wrinkle, um, that I haven't, I haven't seen, uh, or haven't, I haven't heard about or haven't thought about, uh, I always kind of jot it down in a note, even if it's coming from other people who play the product, uh, I'll get questions or stuff like that. And it's like, be, because, you know, a gaming system in itself, is it, it's the product of the players. Um, and, you know, it, it's so much can be added to it because every, every table is different and every situation is different. And you get all these different things that can come at you uh, as a designer mm -hmm. that, that you hadn't even thought of at the time or uh, maybe didn't think were important enough to go into the book. Uh, but then they come back up. So it's always kind of a work in progress. And a lot of these things... Um, when I knew I was doing a core book, um, I knew what I wanted in there to get the genesis going of the basics of playing, um, how uh, the archetype system worked, magic, and did everything uh, in, in that standpoint to get a book out that was usable for people um, and to have fun with. And then when the compendium hit, it, you know, it's a year later, a, 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 another year of playing, um, within the system, and I did a lot of playing this year, um, uh, adapting um, not only old content of games like uh, Stormbringer. Uh, you know, I, I did a, some stuff in uh, Kroll. Uh, I did some stuff in um, uh, Flash Gordon, um, a Conan. Uh, so there's a lot of things I'm looking when I adapt um, fast to those systems. Um, you know, and just see how fast plays in those settings. And they could, they always bring a lot um, because there's so many different things that maybe writers uh, like Robert E. Howard might come in and how his demonology worked and how that would work in my system or in, in Kroll, uh, you know, how it, um, divination, which you don't see in fast, uh, it's plays such a big part in that movie uh, that you add a new wrinkle in there into the magic system and you give people new things. And once I get enough of those, um, I think, okay, this is a good time to put out a compendium that'll add new wrinkles. And I did a lot of playing uh, with just some AD&D stuff in Village of Hamlet. Um, and I did, uh, I, I, we're still running um, uh, Temple of Elemental Evil. And when I did that, um, I also knew that a lot of people, when they were looking at it, um, in Fast, it's an archetype system. So you have combat, your, your basic, I guess, classes, but their archetypes would be combat, um, uh, social, and academic. Uh, but people want to try to put those into a um, a D and D sense, and so I came up with the kit system, which is in the compendium, which allows you to more easily um, take those archetypes, add a kit to it um, that would be like a fighter kit or a paladin kit or an illusionist kit, um, and so it just gives you a little a little extra. Uh, in skills and just kind of a maybe an ability here or something, a faded trait that kind of um, customizes that archetype to a more AD&D sense or a D&D &D, 
uh, sense. Mm -hmm. And so those are all in there. And then I wanted to do that be uh, not only for like an AD&D setting, but I also did it for modern and I did it for sci-fi. So you'd be looking like space mercenaries, kits and stuff like that, or sci psionicists. Um, so a lot of that stuff came into play too, which I thought was really important for, for GMs and players um, to just kind of expand their characters a little bit in the system and have an easier way to understand or immerse yourself when, if you're going from one, like an outside system like D&D into fast, just to make a little more sense to you, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a long story, I guess, on stuff that went in there, but that's just some of the stuff that went in there, but that's how it kind of came to be. Yeah. It is funny you mention that because there is still, there are still a lot of settings in, in, in the in the nineties and and some of the late eight and some of the late eighties that I feel have I feel haven't been touched that I th I think could use a a new a new pers a new perspective on um, yeah one of the big ones from the A D and D era that I that I will that I frequently bring up is um, Al Quadim okay yeah um. And I, I will admit, part of the reason I, I say it is because I, I love the concept of a spell thief. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, right. That that and um, having it, having that and use, using the genies in, in the way that the Sahir does. Right. Oh. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it's an ingenious setting. I, I've obviously got some uh, some Alcadim on my on my bookshelf. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's when you when you look at adapting something like that. I mean, that's that's directly going into you know, obviously the Wizards of the Coast Hasbro Marketplace because it's theirs. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, that that is something to uh, you know that can be looked at. And I do a, I do a series that I'm starting on YouTube where I do uh, it's called Fast Talking, and it's basically uh, me just kind of let's say I, I would bring up Al Kadim and I would say this is how I play it. Uh, in the fast system, and uh, that just gives people uh, kind of a genesis if they wanted to do that to do so without like going into copyright. I mean, I'm, I'm not putting out books or you know charging money or anything like that, but just kind of looking at those different systems, especially ones that haven't been touched, like Al Qadim. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, Wizards of the Coast is coming more into that now because they've got Planescape coming out. They just had uh, they do uh, they spell, will spell never and Dragonlance, but I don't think they'll ever do that one. They uh, do not have like the balls that. to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> they do not have the balls to do it or da or Dark Sun, and Dark, truth Dark be Sun, yeah. and truth be told, at this juncture, I don't think anybody would trust them with it because uh, because um, after that whole OGL fiasco, um, nobody's right. gonna be uh, nobody's gonna be trusting them with a ten foot pole for anything. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know the that was a I mean it was a huge hit to the industry. Um, you know, not to go off off topic, but th it was a big hit to the industry. But I've had people outside the industry or people that are working minis or something like that come back to me, and they're always like, you know, so who who will win? You know, what's the new system? And unfortunately, I think I think you're right. A lot of people won't touch it, but um, I don't think Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro is going away, and neither will D and D. And at some point, if, even if it's ten years down the road, and D and D one happens to be their fourth another fourth edition tragedy. There'll be a you know a D and D two or something, and by that point there'll be a whole generation of new players that will won't even know what happened, uh, and we'll just see them rise up again. So who knows? I mean, but um, it's just kind of one of those things because uh, as, as far as as far as as far as the whole con the whole win concept, um, I think I think what I think what you're going to if I if somebody asked me to do the crystal ball with this. Um, I think what you're going to see is something kind of like what you saw in the in um, the 90s during during that per during that period of time where T where um, TSR where TSR had a lot of a lot of bad karma that they that they built up because of the because of Lorraine Williams's Lorraine Williams's ness. Sure. <laughs> and be and because of that. A lot of a lot of um, a lot a lot of folks and a lot of folks ended up do ended up end up doing their own thing. This was where you get where companies like White Wolf um, start started to make their presence known. Went went Absolutely. because of the because of the vo void being filled since TSR was um, having having all of their having all of their decisions catch up to them. 
right? Yeah, I mean, you can you can certainly find a few companies in there. I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, FASA, they were around, you know, earlier than that, um, but they definitely got a foot forward, um, you know, in, in 1990 or so when they started, you know, kind of picking up steam with Shadowrun and, and Earth on and stuff like that. You, uh, Mid-90s, you, you saw Deadlands, um, you know, that would eventually spawn, you know, uh, savage worlds and stuff like that so i mean it's possible that you can see um, some pretty decent mid-sized companies i guess uh roll roll out of this mm -hmm. and in that's in that's i suppose i suppose in that in that same in that same vein um that's that's why i've, I've said that this is Going to this is going to be the most interesting time to d to dive into the world of tabletop outside of the bubble because a whole lot of people are doing just that. Um, but with the but with that in with that in mind, since you've been since you've been running um, fast in er in earnest for about a year for about a year now, a year and change if we want to get technical. Um, right. What. What were so, what were some of the common things you know you noticed when it came to um, fe feedback and just the learning experience of putting this system out there? I think the most I mean the hardest part about it is um, with any system that's new is to get people to play it. Um, it. It's it's easier to get somebody to buy it than it is to play it, um, which is an odd thing. Um, you know when you're looking at uh, um, you know, various systems, uh, you know, you, you see a lot of people will collect books, especially GMs, um, but uh, you don't see those translate. So I, I think the biggest thing I've seen in, is just trying to connect with enough um, GMs or, or, you know, that are willing to take a chance on it um, and kind of understand the system. And hopefully when they play, um, that their players will come over as well because I think one of the things that all new systems face is um, the D and D reel, which is um, you know it, you you get reeled back into D and D. It's like it's like a system that they know, uh, so it's so hard to transition your players out of that, um, and that's the biggest difficulty here. And I, I think it'll be the biggest difficulty for most games. I mean, one of the reasons that Pathfinder came out of the box so fast and so big um was because they were just three you know D, &D 3.5 they already had the player base and the player base was already mad when they went didn't want to go to fourth edition so they just went to pathfinder and that's why they were able to jump so heavily into it so it'll be interesting to see like somebody like kobold um with tales of valiant uh you know see how that goes and see if you know the, let's say the eight thousand people that are on their kickstarter will actually play the game mm -hmm. Um, because that's the transition. We have to. We as game designers have to find a way um, to get people to play the game, and that's that's the biggest hurdle that I'll, I'll face with anything I do with Fast. Um, just making sure that you know people will play it. Yeah, and I've so. I've seen I've seen people say, up oh, seen people say many times that that the way to do it is through actual plays. I've right. I've been of the opinion that actual plays are a step, but I'm not sure if the, I'm not sure if it goes far enough because the problem, unfortunately, with a, with actual plays is they are they are not as effective of a teaching tool as I think a lot of people believe them to be. Like some, I have I've had plenty of, I've had plenty of students who their main background with t with tabletop RPGs is an actual play like t like dimension 20 or critical role and then they then they try and get then they try and get into tabletop and a actually either playing or gming and the, and it's deer it's deer in the headlights um and i think i think right. i think one step that is that is needed is um is through either through youtube content or, or the like of actually showing how the mechanics work right because yeah which is why i you know it's, i've got it i've got my channel i've had it for years and it's why i put up my real plays so i mean you can watch me play yeah um and i i know, know that when i when i relaunched the actual play podcast that i had years ago um one of the things i pl i plan on doing is putting little asides on how certain 
on how certain things work, as well as having it that session zero is just a session zero and leveling up is just as live streamed as the actual campaign. Right. Oh. Well, one thing, you know, when you're talking about real play as well, like, uh, you know, at conventions or something like that, I, I run into that a lot of, of when you post a question um, to a chat, to a chat room or, or a board or Facebook or something like that. And you, and you say, has anybody ever played, let's say the aliens RPG? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, a lot of people say they haven't, but those that say, yeah, I play it. And it's like, well, do you play it weekly? No, I played it at a convention. Well, did you ever decide to take it back to your own tabletop? Well, no, we just play D&D. &D. You know, so, you know, it, 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 <laughs> it has the ability to show somebody a game, but I'm not sure if there's much of a translation of are they taking that game away with them and trying to translate it to their own table and get a session going. Um when you do those real plays so yeah i mean I, I like you said i don't know how effective that is um you want to believe it is um and you make a connection with people but uh, i just i'm not sure if it's a, a huge a huge leap forward um uh, i think i think the big i think one of the bigger issues is the is the is the self the self the self-fulfilling prophecies of Oh no! Oh, nobody at my table is going to try, so nobody actually tries. Right. Um, which I'm, I'd be, will, I'd be willing to buy that if this was say 1997. But given how there's stuff, there's places like StartPlaying.Games or, um, or the roll, or the Roll Twenty LFG subreddit, I'm a little less inclined. Um. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think that's certainly possible. And I think it might change a little bit as well with as online gaming continues to grow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think I think it's harder to change your table, a physical table and physical people. Because I feel like in that sense, you've played a long time or you know the people or there's one holdout that's like, I won't play it. Um, <laughs> and they kind of run the bully the table. Um, but if you're putting something out uh, in in Roll Twenty or you know uh, you know one of those systems, and uh, then it might be easier because you're inviting people and they're out, they're actively out there looking uh, to play. Um, so that could be a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, shifting shifting back with um, f with fast one one of the sure. things I notice is that. The com the compendium is go is going to be adding a b a bunch of um, a bunch of adventures, and we and this comes as no surprise to me because there were a handful of adventures that were added in in the original f um, original campaign for Fast. Right. But I'd like to get I'd like to get a I'd like to get a vibe for for the for this. So I'm, I'm gonna so starting with beneath beneath Rosloff Keep, right? Um, <clears throat> well, they're really uh, when I did the the fast core book, I did uh, three sample settings in the back. One was traditional fantasy. Um, one was a, uh, a um, kind of a noir fantasy, uh, 1920s esque with um, magic, and then another one is uh, science fiction. Um, uh, uh, a kind of science fiction uh, space cyberpunk kind of thing, a city on the edge of space. Um, and I knew when I put those uh, examples into the Fast Core book um, that uh, if you're if you're trying to get people to play, um, the best thing you can do for them is to try to give them uh, entrances into examples of play and modules. Um, so <laughs> I translated uh, my my most uh, well sold and famous um, traditional fantasy series that I did for AD and D, and I did it for Fifth Edition uh, Rosloff Keep, and then I did the, uh, the the six of those translated into Fast, and then I wrote two, uh, writing the two new uh, adventures, uh, one in the the noir and one in uh, the science fiction. So um, that should give everyone the ability to have a taste of three different ways. To play the multi-genre game, um, and 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 then once you've kind of got the taste of that, maybe you bring it into whatever setting you're. That's you know that you need to scratch the itch of, um, you know, at your own gaming table or you're looking to run. So that's what that's what those are. But Rosloff Keep, um, that's a six-part series. So that'll take you 
through a lot of uh, standard um, AD&D-esque fantasy and, and how your stuff will translate through it. Mm-hmm. Um, given, given, that it t- given that it talks about seven companies representing houses um, yeah. diving into this keep, mm-hmm. the, thing I, the thing that immediately came to mind was that was a gold rush. And was that, was, is that intentional or am I just reading into things? <laughs> Um, I mean, in a way it is, I mean, it's, um, it, it's confined, um, basically, uh, the, the adventure is built around, uh, a, um, like a thinking magical dungeon that, that respawns itself. Um, and, uh, but the only way you can get into it is if you hold one of these standards, uh, like a banner, um, and there are only a certain number of them <clears throat> and they're all magical and um, they've been acquired by houses um, with money and the houses basically um, are hiring um, adventurers to take this banner down and, and get them treasure because treasure constantly responds in the dungeon mm-hmm. and um, so at the end and at the end of the dungeon there's supposed to be a an elixir uh, of eternal life um, so the, the head of the households, these these large houses, these uh, royal noble houses are looking to get their hands on that so um, that the patriarch, you know, could live forever or whatever. Um, so, and then you have to kind of, not only are you competing against a magical dungeon that's, that's working against you, you also have to deal with the fact that, you know, six other companies could be down there and they're looking to kill you as well um, because your competition. Um, so... Um, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting wrinkle, um, to, to standard, uh, dungeon delving. Uh, it was initially, um, proposed to me probably back in 2000. I was, I was in a gaming group and, uh, a guy said, you can't make an original dungeon. It's impossible. Um, <laughs> that's one of my players Famous said last words. Said, Right. And I said, I'll show you. Um, and then we ended up playing it for a couple of years. Uh, so anyway, it was, uh, and there, uh, and then this kind of translated into the first series of adventures that I wrote for the folio, um, my, my adventure series. And it, uh, and it, that is Rosloff keep. So that's where that comes from. And then obviously over the course of 20 years, 20 odd years, uh, uh, you know, I built different things into it and, uh, you know, expanded it cause it's been played so many times by so many different people, not only myself, but others. Um, so it's just, it's a really, really fun adventure. Um, and there's so many different things that you can do with it. And there's so many different obstacles uh, and fun NPCs uh, that are always kind of pushing at you. And mysteries, you know, murder. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on in it through the course of it. There's a, there's a plague that breaks out. Um, so anyway, it's, it's really fun. Um, and it kind of takes place in um, a castle called Rosloff Keep, um, which was uh, I named after Jim Rosloff, uh, who did um, so many great pieces uh, in the early 80s for uh, D&D, and he did um, uh, the cover uh, to um, keep on the Borderlands, and that's what this keep is kind of based on, that, that, that far away keep, uh, you know, that's, that's far away from civilization. Yep. So... And when it comes to tremors, and tremors in the machine, yeah. um, <laughs> what, what sort, what sort of, what sort of approach were you, were you intending to go with that module? Uh, well, tremors in the machine is funny. So um, basically, what happens is um, the, the 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 magical dungeon. Um, it is obviously underground, and there's an earthquake. And uh, the infernal machine, which is what runs this dungeon, this magical machine, it thinks that the surface world is attacking it um, because it doesn't understand the concept of what a what an earthquake is. Um, so it decides it's going to attack the outside world, and that's where this magical plague comes in um, to effect. Um, so then the, the the heroes are dealing not only with a plague on the surface, but also the fact that the the dungeon is thinking it's being attacked from the outside. And I mean, there's all kinds of craziness that goes on in it. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just another fun wrinkle to a dungeon that you're, you're trying, it's six levels. So, um, you're basically trying to get down to the sixth level through the six adventures. Um, and, uh, that's just, that's just one of the pieces of it, man. It, it, it gets a little hairy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
with um, Curse of the Violet Cor- Curse of the Violet Corruption. Um, <laughs> okay. Has the has I'm guess I'm guessing with what what sort of vibe did you want did you want to go with with um with that one? Well, I mean, it's kind of a um, it, it, it's a zombie movie. Um, so you know, um, it, it kind of has that feel um, on the surface. Um, uh, and so I was going with a little bit of uh, that horror factor. Um, and uh, while the characters um, in it are protected because uh, anybody who is a banner company man and has one of these banners, uh, they're not seen as a threat um, by the infernal machine. So it does not try to cl- corrupt them with this, um, the violent corruption. Uh, but people that they know on the surface or people that they've run into for all these modules, um, they are uh can can be affected so uh it's kind of like saving your friends um and uh you know just the horror of uh you know people getting infected with this and the infected running around the town and and then you have to kind of weigh in the effect of uh can we cure them uh do we kill them um if you know if we do and then we cure to cure them how many people have we killed and you know it's, so there's a lot of stuff that weighs on the characters um throughout a lot of choices uh, and how they want to deal with um, with this. Uh, meanwhile, trying to uh, stop the corruption um, and, and c- kind of a, make an explanation or, or get the dungeon to understand, hey, this this was not anybody's business. This was just a natural event. Um, you don't need to try to take it out on the keep or any of the people there. So, with that with that in mind. Uh, with Sec- with secrets of the wild with secrets of the wildlands is that mo- is that going to be leaning more into a um he- a hex crawl approach given that given that they're going to be out in the wild instead of in a dungeon? I mean a little bit. Um, it's still dungeon based. It it just basically uh, takes the characters um, away from the keep because they have to find another way into the dungeon. Um, and so that takes them outside and they would be there. Uh, the setting itself is, is based around, um, druids, uh, who are summoning in these berserkers from another dimension and the berserkers collect skulls and the more skulls they have, the more they can kind of warp in and back between their dimension and our dimension. So, um, you have to actually, um, instead of just going dungeon delving all the time, you actually have to go out and maybe deal with, with these attacks of the berserkers or something like that and kind of see the world a little more um, just around the keep. So, yeah, it's a little bit, I mean, it doesn't really go into great detail like, uh, you know, a hex crawl where you're like, <clears throat> you know, camping for days or anything like that because it's a fairly short jaunt uh, but you are outside for a little bit and then you have to kind of d- discover the cave entrance that'll take you to the you know the alternate entrance where you can get back in so yeah it gives you a little bit of i just wanted i, I felt like at that point people probably uh wanted to breathe a little bit get get out of the dungeon uh, and explore a little more uh so i just gave them kind of that that ability to to get out uh, a little bit before they go into the final kind of run of the last couple levels um, speak, speaking of, then there's deep dive into the flooded halls. Yep. Uh, well, the, the, <laughs> when the dungeon is breached, um, with the, uh, from the, uh, earthquake, um, one of the levels is actually open to an underground, um, river. And so it floods. Mm-hmm. And so, so, uh, this is basically a dungeon crawl in water. So I took a lot when I did this from, um, uh, Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh. Um, in, in the in that series, the Salt Marsh series, the uh, um, you have to go into like a, a I think it's the Sahagan Lair at the, in the third uh, part of that trilogy, and it's all underwater and, and how you deal with that. Um, and I think water is always something that gives you the opportunity as a as a DM or players to fight things that you don't normally fight. Um, you know, fish and squid and all kinds of weird stuff that they're in the monster manual, but unless you're specifically playing a sea campaign, you're probably not going to see them. Um, 
and it gives you a creepiness of just you know being in a, a flooded dungeon mm -hmm. uh it's kind of creepy itself so uh and some of the rooms uh don't flood completely so you can like get up out of there and then uh anyway it's it's just another it's just another wrinkle to make the dungeon different mm -hmm. so then there then there is realms of madness and despair which i believe is meant yeah. to be the grand finale of the of this length of this lengthy campaign right and, and it it basically takes a lot of the storyline threads that have run through the first five parts um and alliances that have formed and friendships that have formed and uh you know th uh things that the characters have uh uh, come across during their their delving uh, and allows those to all kind of be put together uh, in a way that um, nobody else has ever put them together um, or had the opportunity to and this will j this will prompt the characters to actually make it to the end mm -hmm. um, that the company to make it to the end where no one has ever been before because they didn't have all the pieces in place that the characters would should have uh, if done correctly um, managed to get through the course of the first five adventures so and then it's like uh there's different um realms <clears throat> like uh you know pocket realms within it um that you kind of jump to uh, in that final adventure to to you know take out the final bosses and then uh, eventually get to the infernal machine and, and deal with it mm -hmm. so with the that and I also the next one I wanted to ask is on Keeper of the Yellow Gate, which seems to really really lean into eight eighties and nineties um, um, cyberpunk and a little bit of two thousand AD. Yeah, uh, that's the city on the edge of the space. Uh, that's Lorem Femina, um, and this kind of introduces you to that setting. Um, obviously, the the final two modules aren't as vast as what you're going to find uh, in Roslov Keep because they don't have a six part story, um, but it basically introduces you to that setting um, and gives you you know uh, allows you to kind of explore the lingo of the setting, uh, which I thought found, always found was kind of fun. Uh, if you ever played Shadowrun and uh, or if you ever even played Planescape and kind of got into um, the different languages or, or slang i guess that that goes um, along with that is always a lot of fun so that's in there uh and that's kind of just exploring um not only the the base of the city and kind of how it runs and getting your feet wet um but also um uh getting in contact with keeper of the yellow gate which are um in the city uh it's run by um, a lot of guilds and stuff like that but there are uh, these gates that the city were built around and they're run by these aliens uh that they're kind of that for no better purpose they're called worms and um that nobody knows their purpose but they take slaves into the into the into their gates and then they bring out trade goods that the city needs and the the slaves are never seen again um so there is an abandoned gate within this one and a, and a worm that wants to specifically to talk to the characters and you kind of start to figure out the mysteries of the gate And with and then the last in the list is the takers of the tomb king. Yeah, and the, so in Hygarian City, which is uh, basically a kind of a, a, a fantasy magic Chicago nineteen twenties esque mm -hmm. setting, um, it's. Uh, this takes you through um, like the bootlegging industry uh, of uh, uh, fruits, which is fairy juice, uh, which is prohibited, and um, also uh, gets you kind of involved in some of the gangs there, uh, understanding the concept of the Necromancers Guild and that um, the city is um, has a workforce of the undead um, because uh large corporations have figured out if they buy the undead they're once they buy them they're free and they can work them quote unquote until they fall apart or death um so then that that, that throws the city into um a depression because <laughs> alive people can't get jobs or at least menial jobs um that the undead have taken so um you get to go through and kind of experience that um and then uh deal with a you know a, um, one of the cults that's um illegally taking bodies uh to sell to the necromancers guild for um to be turned into 
uh, undead workers and stuff like that so it's fun as well i mean like speakeasies and uh, stuff like that um, are all in there but it's kind of gives you a different feel with having you know half orc bouncers and and uh <laughs> kobold you know fruce runners and stuff like that so it, it's just a different uh it's a different feel as well and like i said when i made all these i wanted to give people who are playing it um the ability to test out different uh different settings and i think all these do that um really well so um at least hopefully that'll get people playing and that that's the most important thing you know it, it's hard to launch a system without having available modules that people can easily take um read and then kind of understand what they're looking at at least gm wise and go okay i can i can run this um instead of trying to just make them do it all themselves here's a bunch of rules run it um so i think that was the most important thing about trying to create uh, these particular adventures mm -hmm. Now, within the compendium itself, obviously yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that could be go gone over. But what would right. be some of the what would be some of the highlights that you'd bring up when it comes to what's in Compendium Volume One? Well, I've already discussed the kits. I think those are those are really big, uh, a, a big part of it. But um, and, and other than just some, there's going to be a lot of like uh, just clarifications of certain rules or things that weren't um overtly talked about like swimming defined you know just weird stuff like that and then but one of the you know one of the things that i go through a lot i um i have some new faded traits which are i think are very important to the system um and uh you get some new spells which i think everybody likes new spells new spell categories um and then probably the most important if you're playing fast a lot would be the expansion of the leveling system which fast has 10 levels um, but the compendium goes from leveling 11 to 20 and in the course of those leveling, it also gives you um, a new kind of new bonuses to your character by becoming a master archetype or a grand master archetype as you go up in level. So those are big. Um, I go into some clarifications um, on weapons, reach, uh, new rules for shields, which I think make a lot more sense than what we saw in the basic um, edition, and then some magic weapon stuff. And then I go into also um, a better, better, or just more expansive ways to create monsters and giving them faded traits and expanding on NPCs as well. Um, so I think those are probably some of the biggest things other than, you know, j within the course of all the stuff that's in there. Mm -hmm. There are a few, there are a few, na there are a few words that were in the, that were in the, that little graphic that you put in that I'm, I am curious about, ex about expanding upon. Um, sure. Yeah. One of them is attack magic. Is it what would what would separate that from the standard magic magic approaches in fast? Okay, I what I wanted to do. I, a lot of people when they when they play fast, um, they they have a disconnect between um, exactly how uh, attacking with a spell uh, how it varied from attacking with a, a sword. Um, and so this is just a clarification of how that attack magic is used, um, what exactly it goes against, be it, uh, a, you know, a defensive threshold, um, uh, or something like that, or if it's used specifically, uh, like a psionic ability as an attack, um, does it go against, uh, does it, does a, does a target not get its defensive threshold and therefore just go off of an intelligence uh, did they get any kind of defense against that? So it's just basically expanding the attack section uh, for spells just to give clarification on uh, how those work um, for people who did have questions on it mm -hmm. that I've, I've had come back to me. Yep. Yeah. Now, when it, com when it comes to character kits and the creating character yep. kits, what does that entail? Okay, so um, basically what it does, um, so when you make a standard character uh, in Fast as an archetype, uh, all archetypes get one primary skill uh, and two secondary skills, a secondary combat skill, uh, and a hobby skill. So um, you're talking about, uh, what is that, f five total 
five total skills. Um, and you can kind of mess and, and mesh those around if you want to as you make the character. But that's that's the base. Be your combat. It doesn't matter if you're combat. It doesn't matter if you're uh, social. It doesn't matter if you're academic. Um, but what the kits do is say, okay, I, I'm looking to play a wizard character. How do I go about doing that? Um, do they get anything extra? And, and in that standpoint, they would, um, where um, they would start with... Um, <laughs> a secondary skill in casting uh, so you're basically an apprentice wizard uh, so that's a bonus skill so instead of starting with five you'd start with six um, and little little things like that so um, like a fighter character would get an extra primary in combat so they have a couple combat skills um, and uh, you know a paladin starts out with the faded trait of uh, firebrand of faith so they can turn uh, the undead and stuff like that um so it, it just it looks at what standard classes or standard uh you know standard classes in other games might have be it a D, D or any other game um and then kind of uh gives you the ability to just add a little a little extra to the character in their creation um to kind of round them out a little more toward that that class mm -hmm. and Speaking of that, with grand with grandmaster archetypes, is that meant to be a a, a um, the equi the equivalent of say prestige classes or specializations in other games? No, it not really. Everyone gets it um, when you go up to a certain level, and what it basically allows you to do, it just gives you a couple little extra wrinkles. And one of the things um, that a uh, a grandmaster or a, a master can do is take one of their um, skills and it can uh, technically go up to 10 where all skills, all primary skills are uh, capped at 9, um, but it'll allow a skill to go up to 10. Just little things like that. And a grandmaster could take two skills up to 10 or, or no, maybe they take one skill up to so it could go up to 11. Things like that. Um, so it basically just makes you uh, a master of your archetype, uh, basically, and it just gives you uh, three or four small things uh, that will um, set you apart um, from a bit more base uh, character because to have a, a 10 in this skill is kind of like a superpower. Um, so it just shows how uh, the mastery you have of your of your archetype. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure it's only a matter of time before somebody makes a spinal tap joke. <laughs> yeah, this one goes up to 11. <laughs> I'd be disappointed if somebody hadn't beaten me to the punch about it. All right. <laughs> but and I'm get and of course of course um one of the other things I saw, I saw mentioned was new grappling rules which grappling has always been one of those tricky things to handle, but if you're if you have somebody whose background is in some in some form of wrestling in one of the many different styles of wrestling that exist out there it's one of those things that has to get brought up right uh, you you run into it so much more than i thought you would um it, it's amazing to me um how people sitting around a table playing a a, a a role-playing game somebody wants to grab somebody like you're in a bar and they grab somebody or somebody just wants to grab somebody for some reason it's kind of amazing so it, it just it meant to me that i needed to take a, a stronger look at the grappling rules um and clarify certain things of um how exactly you go about doing it mm -hmm. um so, you know and, and again i mean Grappling rules, they, they obviously go back a long way. I mean, if you played, if you played AD and D, and, and you look up grappling grappling rules, um, and you see on those old character sheets, there's like a an entire stat block for grappling. Yeah, and let's not say like, we didn't. <laughs> yeah, right. And it was like as a kid, I, I, I as an adult, I don't even know if I ever did it. Uh, you know, got all my grappling stuff down, but it's so intense. But and I try to make it the least painful possible. Uh, while giving people with the ability of, let's say, unarmed or a martial art or something like that, a better chance to grab a hold of somebody that you know that has no skill whatsoever in in uh, you know hand to hand combat. So, um, and you know, clarifying what exactly happens when you hit, um, you know, and uh, just again, just 
just expanding on it just to make sure that the questions that have come to me get answered um, for those people looking at it, which I think is obviously import, important for an RPG because yeah. people are there are rule, rules lawyers out there and people want to know the answer. So. Well, for me, it's it's not necessarily a rules layer issue as much as much as my fit my a lot of my students have very little have very little background in table in tabletop RPGs and that is and there is and I do that with a specific intent because of the fact that they don't have a background in in that they don't fall they are less susceptible to falling into certain assumptions. Um. Like I'll, I'll I'll recruit people who are who are fans of say comic books or uh, or of um or of or of ma or of manga or of vit or video games or, or or the like, and some of some of the people at my table are wrestling fans, and naturally <laughs> they're going to want to bring some of that into the into the characters that they make. Um, and while some people might say you can't do that, I'll, I'm of the mindset of. Okay, you can do it, but maybe, but maybe, re but maybe rethink the approach. Right, and that inevitably leads into wanting to do grappling, especially since um, one run one running gag that one of my players will will let, will inevitably do is use is use one of the enemies as an improvised weapon. I.e., I will hit a motherfucker <laughs> with another motherfucker. Really, <laughs> it's amazing. Like it's, it's, it cracks me up. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of times I've had to improvise how th how that works, and I'm I'm no stranger to improvising it, but I would I would prefer having having so having some sort of baseline I can I can build around, so I'm not I'm not firing blind. Right, exactly. Because I I know a lot of I know a lot of people, especially a lot of veterans, will say just house rule it. My counter to that has always been house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. And last time right. I checked, you don't bit you don't um you don't bury your your um dinner in black pepper. Right. <laughs> right. And I, you know in the fast system I have a grappling rule. I mean it's there, but this I just wanted to give people an even stronger base to build on, to put that spice on afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So that that's what I'm looking at here. Like I said, a lot of this comes from just working a table, you know, working the table for for a year and, and seeing what comes up. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, putting putting too much putting too putting too many sauces on onto a dish is a good way to get the chef to want to kill you. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. But with, I also saw that you put you put in new rules about about crossbows and weapons with reach. I'm guessing those were things that got brought up to you. Yeah, I mean. Crossbows are always one of those tricky things. It's like, um, you know, and I, I get this brought to. I, I have a uh, a GM who likes to play uh, likes to play science fiction, and um, they are always asking speci for specific um, rulings on like if I used a laser against plate mail, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? Uh, so that's always something that's ta that gets taken in and it might be addressed maybe in another compendium but um this one was specifically for the fact of how you deal with um the penetrate penetrative power of a crossbow um and the limitations of a crossbow and reloading versus its penetrative power and kind of how to balance that um so uh that's basically uh taken in there and then also i i when I initially did fast, obviously fast is called fast for a reason because I didn't want to over inundate people with rules, which is why I didn't uh, initially include something like reach. Um, but I thought it probably would come up enough at, at tabletops um, at this point that people might want to have a, a quick rule for it. So, you know, I put that in as well. Um, and then, but. So, but the only caveat to that would be obviously the the GM would have to decide the weapons that have reach because I don't have a huge weapon block um, of a, of sample weapons you know that that would need to all say if it has reach or not. Obviously, a spear would have reach, a halberd would have reach, um, a two handed sword could have reach. You know, it's just kind of at your discretion. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then I also I did the <coughs> when I was looking at shields. One of the things that I found. This the more we played um, is the more the system mechanic itself 
lent to not ever using a shield. It just it didn't make any sense to use a shield. And obviously, shields in fantasy are hugely um, something. Well, not in fantasy, in history, where something are hugely important, and they they are impactful, right? To use one, so I wanted to find another way um, for the shield to come into play and make it worth having it. And I think I've done that in uh, the new play tests for the, the shield. So I'm pretty happy with those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with now one of the, one of the other things that, that does, that does draw my attention is the idea of magical weapon growth. I'm guessing yeah. what that's going to entail <laughs> is, um, ma- is magic weapons that develop, that develop abilities alongside the player. That is correct. Yeah, one of the things that always frustrated me with um, basic fantasy, let's say D&D, is that um, I always felt that there was a great importance uh, uh, that that would be found if you found a magic weapon, right? Um, even if that's a plus one dagger, like it's a magic dagger, uh, and it was devalued um as you played because you'd find a dagger plus two and the dagger plus one would be sold or dumped you know or given to an npc or something like that and it's like but that was your first magic weapon what are you what are you getting rid of it for you know i mean typically people have an attachment to things that i think is never really seen on a tabletop or very rarely um where someone gets that plus one sword and keeps it for 10 levels even though that they then they pass up a holy avenger like who's going to do that um, but one of the things that I looked at with this was obviously I don't want to make every weapon, um, something that, you know, c- can grow, but <clears throat> if you find a weapon, um, that is named, it, it was the moniker that I use here. So something that's like, you know, Abrax, the, the darkness cleaver or something, even if it's plus one, when you find it, uh, it's, uh, it gives the ability of the GM to allow that weapon to grow um, with the character. So that plus one sword, let's say you got as a paladin at first level, maybe it turns into a holy weapon when you get to fifth, and then an avenger at 10th. That's basically what this does. It gives the, the GM the ability to unlock powers and bonuses as the character grows. Um, the only caveat to that caveat to that is that I put in here as well as magical weapon bonding, um, which means to get that to happen you have to bond with that weapon and if you bond with the weapon you're giving away some of your magical essence or ccv is what it's called in the game and that's very important to a lot of people and they don't want to give that up so it it is a cost um, but it makes it it makes it valuable and you feel like i'm not going to dump that weapon now i put ccv to bond to it um so uh it's just a way for you to get more familiar or or enjoy your magical weapons a little more uh, and make them more of a, a factor in the game and a good story point. Mm-hmm. And given given that the it's funny you bring that up because um, when we look at a lot of when you look at a lot of fantasy fiction and some um, science fantasy, this idea of just getting magic magic items left and right isn't really a thing like let's use um let's use the f- let's use the first conan movie for example right. the closest you don't have conan with a with a bunch of different gear the clo- the um, the closest thing to a magic item that you that he has is the atlantean sword yep yeah. um in the in some in something like say the legend of zelda you had yeah. You have you don't have you don't have a replace you have some you have some different swords but the master sword is not is not replaced sometimes sometimes it's upgraded like the like the goddess sword in um in Skyward Sword but that's but that's upgrading it that's not replacing it right a magic I- in I've always held the belief that a magic item should be should be a small story in in uh, in and of itself. I, should, I'm of the same school. Yeah, it shouldn't. I've e- I've even told I've even told people in the past a plus one longsword is not interesting. It's still it's still a lo- it's still a longsword. Now, if you if you say that if you say that it's a pl- it's a plus one longsword that was be- that was 
but that was built by it was built by a, a master craftsman and the and thus and thus um treat treats treats iron weapons as if they were made of paper see that that is interesting that is yeah. giving that is giving someone an edge in both a narrative sense of why is it why is it able to just to just treat treat the, treat um iron as if it's cutting through wood while well, it was well, it was made by a craftsman who was really really good at this oh um, and it's giving them a, mecha a mechanical edge to explain why they're able to cut through armor right oh uh, up up to a point the in something like star wars the f you have you have luke with two lightsabers in the in the in the course of the original trilogy the first one was the hand me down from his father and yep. the second one is the one that he built that he built himself after after coming to terms with it, with the revelation about his father yeah i'm i'm of course vastly simplifying matters but i i think you i think you see where i'm going with this this idea that there is a story to that magic item the the story of where did you get where did you get that thing and and making and making the story have a tangible effect mechanically as well Right, and I think that's what this section is leans heavily into, uh, making magic um, special uh, again. Um, so that's why I looked at doing that, um, and, I, and I think it's <clears throat> not only is it fun for the characters, but I think it's or the players, but I think it's fun for the GM too, yeah. um, because you always have that carrot out there of well, when you get to third, maybe it'll maybe something else will happen with that blade. <laughs> when you get to seventh, maybe something will happen. so. Uh, it makes it even more fun to to try to see how that bonding with the with the and with for what, magic items. Works. For what it's worth, the reason I brought up Star Wars in this was to demonstrate that it that magic items don't have to be limited to a fantasy setting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in uh, <laughs> I like to put um, within my science fiction settings, um, you know. Uh, uh, relics um of a lost civilization right a, a, a techno advanced civilization that you would think are, are magic but they're not they're just so far above what where you're at um so yeah i mean any of those kind of items uh can can be done in the exact same way well there's two there's two um there's two parts to the clark's law rem re remark that everybody references on one hand Yes, on one hand, there's the any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yep. But a lot of people forget about the other half of that quote. Any sufficiently <laughs> researched it. magic is indistinguishable from technology. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. But the... Uh, even and even the even the lost tech is that's one angle but another another potential angle is just that it's made it's just that it's made by somebody who rarely who rarely makes items and those items are coveted um right i remember i remember as a kid reading a short story by gary paulson called the rifle which talked about this idea of this legend among gunsmiths of a sweet rifle this rifle that was so that was so well made so so uh, meticul so meticulously done that a gunsmith could only make one of them in their life. And right. The and um that that kind of that kind of thing could 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 certainly be utilized because there's there if you look at if you look at say the reverence of to that people have towards the work of John Moses Browning. The get the get the guy who the guy who <laughs> Who's who has been jokingly called the god of firearms, just because of right. all the designs that he that he made that are still used to this day. Um, how would how would that be any different from 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 say a from say a master blacksmith making a master crafted sword? Yeah, it absolutely wouldn't. You know, it, you would fall into the same into the same venue, I would think. Mm -hmm. And throw, throwing the throwing magic item rules in the in that is ju is just um, taking that and taking that into a further extreme right and 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 one thing that people have to keep into concept uh, you know into into the concept of this is <clears throat> when you say magic or you say something like that i mean a bonus is a bonus plus one plus two plus three whatever that bonus is um so again it you know using a sweet rifle um that you have 
mastered as you've grown, your bonuses would go up in it just like that. Even though it's not necessarily quote unquote magic, um, it still has the same purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same growth. And I'm guessing that's also the reason why why magic weapon bonding is brought up because when I hear that, I think of magic items and the like that are inextricably inextricably linked with right. their with their user. Um, an easy an easy an, an easy answer to this would be the way Thor is depicted in Marvel comics with with um with it with Yggdrasil and not not with Yggdrasil what am I saying with Mjolnir and how that's mm. how that's um how that will always how that keeps coming back to him but right. a better I suppose a better example would be the Soul Reaver in in specifically the way Raziel uses it in the Legacy of Cain games where it is a symbiotic weapon of his Right, you could go to that kind of a, an extreme of a bond, or you could go even into a, a semi-modern setting and say something like Quigley Down Under, um, you know, in, in his rifle, um, you know, uh, <laughs> he would be bonded to that weapon. You know, I mean, it's just that kind of stuff, you know, so um, that, you know, he can he can shoot somebody, you know. <laughs> He's been waiting out there all day for three of us to get in, get in a line, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, anyway, yeah, I mean, all that works. Um, from Would, the from the highly magical uh, Thor examples, or you know, to even a mundane example of somebody that's just that is their weapon. They can make the bullets for it personally. They do all. I mean, everything that it takes to 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 make them yeah. one with a particular weapon. Would you Would you also put when it comes to bonded, would you also use the lawgivers from Judge Dredd in, the, in a similar similar mindset? I think you could, yeah. Like, and Dredd's such a neat setting, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because because if anybody other than the designated judge um, tries to fire the thing, they will um, right. find them. <laughs> they'll find themselves disarmed, quite literally. <laughs> quite literally, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a great um, caveat. Um, to talk about like one of my fast talks is if I ever did dread um, that it's just uh, yeah that that a bonded weapon you could have even have a negative effect if you grab somebody else's bond weapon it it retributive strikes you basically like you're <laughs> like you get ego whipped um, like get the hell away from me you're not you're not my bonded partner yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. Or even, even again, if you go mundane, you know, if you pick up somebody's rifle that they've used all these years, and you're like, it's top heavy. I can't shoot with this damn thing. You know, it's like, you know, but they're so used to it because you know, whatever, whatever way they shoot is just different than you. So that's their bond. You know, it's like this always shoots to the right. Well, not for me because I know because I always lean left or you know whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you could put any of that stuff in as wrinkles uh, with the GM. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and ad admitted, admittedly, it would be a bit nuts to to give someone a lawgiver because of because of all the different ammo types that those things are supposed to have. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, because you're you're, ba you're basically giving somebody like eight like eight different types of weapons all at once. Then right. again, right. um, the then again, given how given how the world of mega of Mega City One. Well, I was gonna call it a shithole, but I feel that'd be quaint. <laughs> like it, you're you're you can you kind of you kind of need it, and that's also not that's also and speaking of that, that's given what given what given how fast it's supposed to be multi-genre and ma and magic items don't have to be limited to fantasy. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up some of the crazy weapons that were in um, first-person shooters when I when we were growing up. Um, especially yeah. there's no there's no way somebody can say somebody can say that you that you couldn't you that um you that you should use standard rules when when setting up the BFG for instance. Right. <laughs> especially if you're using the the um hack together rules that it had in the original Doom where it would fire right. 40 original tr fire um 40 tracers which is how it hits right. pe which is how it hits people who aren't even in the same room. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Doom was something back in the day, wasn't it? Well, it's, it's still it still is, and there's still and there's still people making mods. Although, um, I will I will always have more of a preference for two than the than the original, simply because 
the original Doom is not a good is not a good game to marathon. They were still they were still in that mindset of pu of putting in as many levels as possible. It's also the same reason I don't recommend anyone marathon say Wolfenstein 3D because it overstay after it way overstays its welcome after the first episode. <laughs> like even even um even Blake's Blake Stone is better than Wolfenstein 3D, but there is a total of 60 levels, and that's before you get into expansions. That's crazy. You know, it's be when you have a tile editor, you can make you can make level you can make levels on the fly. There's le there's levels that have been that were made with that with a tile editor in literal minutes. Wow. Oh, uh, but with but with all with all of that with all of that in mind, I. I also noticed that you have that you um, added in as part of the as part of this Kickstarter a G, a GM screen. Um, yep. Did you end up improvising a GM screen early on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was one of the things that I, I you know uh, I used a you know I've got fifty DM screens here uh, on my shelf, so I just grab one down and um, print out you know critical charts and. Uh, basic, you know, rule sets and stuff that, that, that were needed and just clipped them to it. Um, so I kind of knew what I wanted and what I thought people would need. Um, so, yeah, that was one of the first things I thought as well um, for the ease of, uh, of being a, a GM that uh, you kind of needed this, especially with a new system, um, you know, just to have that available to you. So I wanted to make sure that that was out there and available as well. So, yeah, I went, went right for it. Now, with with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as the page count for the compendium? I mean, it's not going to be too big. I don't think it'll go over fifty pages, and it's just a PDF. So you know, it's a, so um, that's probably what we're looking at. I'm, I'm not really looking to add anything in it through stretch goals or anything like that. So um, that's that would probably be the max it would hit. Um, you know, I uh, the the fast. I don't even know how many. The fast core book itself, I think, when uh, is uh, only 170 pages. So you know, we it, it's not going to add in so much uh, that would be as big as the the book itself. But it's a great smaller supplement to it. And it, it, there's a possibility that you know um, later they could be pot compiled into a larger uh, volume several of the compendiums together and then put into something physical hardcover or something like that to add to the the overall pantheon of the fast system but i think this is a great start mm -hmm. and i will certainly be looking for looking forward to seeing it oh, but with all that said I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. I loved it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!